morning, good afternoon, and welcome to this panel on the very important topic of the prospects for European investment in Iran. My name is Nikki. I'm a researcher focusing on Iran at Control Risks, a specialist global risk consultancy. While a substantial volume of European trade with Iran has continued to flow since the U.S.'s withdrawal from the nuclear deal, sanctions have led most European plans for strategic and financial investment in Iran to be put on hold. I'm joined today by five experts who have managed or advised inbound European investment in Iran who will explain what will need to change before European multinational companies and financial investors once again consider deploying capital in Iran. Dr. Said Ali Mohammad Al Musavi is the Deputy Minister and President of the Organization for Investment, Economic and Technical Assistance in Iran, which is responsible for promoting, financing and regulating foreign investment in the country. The organization is affiliated to Iran's Ministry of Economic Affairs and Finance. We are then joined by Omid Ghulami Far, who is the CEO of Circland Invest, a Swedish investment company which sources and develops growth equity investment opportunities, mainly in the Iranian market. We are then joined by Ramin Rabi, the CEO of Turquoise Partners, an Iran-based financial services company offering investment management, brokerage, and advisory services for the Iranian market to both domestic and foreign clients. Maciej Voital is the founder of and CIO of Amtalon Capital, a European asset management company focused on Iranian equity markets. And finally, we're joined by Piruzan Parvine, lawyer and partner at Denton's, where he helps clients manage their legal risks in the EMEA region and particularly Iran. We have one hour for this panel, so I'm going to ask the speakers to limit their initial remarks to five minutes to leave plenty of time for the discussion and for some questions from the audience. Let's begin with Dr. Musavi. Dr. Musavi, what are some of the steps that your organization took to create the business environment around the JCPOA period? Um, perhaps you can also briefly explain the Foreign Investment Promotion and Protection Act and how investors can feel that their investments in Iran are safe and that they own what they have invested in the country. Good morning, good afternoon, uh, Madam uh, Moderator, distinguished guests, uh, panelists. Um, let me at the outset um, extend my appreciation to the organizer of the Iran EU Business Forum which bring us uh, this valuable opportunity for discussing and reviewing the prospect of um, EU investment in Iran. You have my voice? Everything is clear? Yes, everything is clear. Okay. Also, I should give my regards to you and the distinguished panelists in this meeting. I hope by this intervention, I could express the Iranian government's commitment to open investment and explain role of Ministry of Economic Affairs and Finance. And of course, my organization for investment, economic and technical assistance of Iran in promotion and protection of the investment. Um, you know that in few past years, the special relation between Iran and Europe has been under effect by imposing uh, unilateral and illegal sanction by the US. Although it had some effects on Iran economy, but on the other hand, the European companies also lost a great potential in major Iranian infrastructure projects in different sectors, large market and rich resources of Iran. Over the years, we have met many challenges and opportunities in our relation. But after the JCPOA, we opened new era of cooperation with European countries. Exchange of high ranking delegation immediately after JCPOA showed the interest of both sides for fostering the bilateral economic cooperation. In comparison with the long historic relation and potential of the cooperation in different sectors, we should promote and support the companies for more cooperation. As an introduction to my organization, the Organization for Investment, Economic and Technical Assistance of Iran 
known as OETI, is the sole official authority of Iran for promotion of foreign investment and responsible under the law of attract foreign investment into Iran. Madam uh, and dear uh, friend and panelist, uh, audience, Iran is pioneer in the region regarding the international rule and procedures. The Iran's law on protection and uh, promotion of foreign investment known as FIPA since 1955 provides fast protection for foreign investment and gives them the same rights as the Iranian investors. Agreements on promotion and protection of foreign investment have been signed with more than 72 countries. Let me briefly, let me briefly give you some examples of protective measures that FIPA offers the foreign investors. First of all, no limitation on equity percentage, volume of investment, profit transfer, capital repatriation, types of capital imported, types of investment, and of course, no import export restriction and equal treatment towards foreign investment as accorded to the local investors. Secondly, as I mentioned before, we have a good international treaties, as from, for example, bilateral investment treaties with 72 countries, as I mentioned before, and also avoidance of double taxation treaties with 42 countries, custom cooperation treaties with 48 countries, as well as other international fundamental economic treaties. And uh, full, cover, full government support and services providing free of charge before and after care services to foreign investors, three years multi-entry visa, three years residence permit, work permit, covering political risks such as nationalization, expropriation, government intervention, breach of contracts and currency transfer for foreign investment. And the facilitation of foreign investment procedure in Iran through 31 provincial investment services center at each and every provinces of Iran. Uh, maybe I should stop here, uh, Madam. Later on, um, I'm ready to um, answer any possible question. For the time being, I stop here. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Musavi. Uh, let's turn to Omid now. Omid, how are you able to originally convince European investors to invest in Iranian private sector firms following the JCPOA? And what are some of the lessons learned for investors over the past years in terms of the sanctions environment or domestic changes? Um, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, depending on where you are. Uh, Nikki, can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. Great, thank you. Thank you for inviting me again. I've been a participant um, in this event since it all started back in 2014 and happy to be with you again. Um, I'm going to cover your questions uh, briefly, um, how I was able to originally convince European investors to invest in Iran actually comes back to my own history, as I have been an investor myself for the last uh, decade and a half, investing substantial amount of capital for uh, Nordic investors around the world. And when I first started looking at Iran, um, I look at it from the same frame as I would um, look at any other opportunity and country, um, although I am Iranian myself and born there. And what I saw is the elevator pitch uh, that I will give you now that I gave investors uh, some years back. First of all, uh, Iran is the world's 18th largest economy. This is commonly misunderstood because people look at Iran from a nominal perspective rather than a real PPP adjusted perspective. And this is not really surprising if you consider that Iran's 83 or so million people 
uh, also makes the country the 18th most populous country in the world. So there is no huge discrepancy there. And I think it's the correct way of looking at it. Second of all, Iran is a very diversified economy uh, and not commodity dependent as is commonly perceived elsewhere. Its geographical positioning is second to none for logistics and commerce. It has great demographics with more than two thirds of the population under the age of 35. And it's search sufficient in terms of important raw materials such as energy, minerals, and electricity, physical uh, capital such as roads, ports, and airports, and labor in the young educated um, uh, people um, that um, constitute a big part of the population. On top of this, it offers a very high return on investment, which I've shared in these forums before, which is really second to none compared to any other country in the world. It has a high growth potential. Uh, it's been held back over the last few years again, but it's sort of untapped and will be unleashed at some point in the future. It has very low external debt, which is again unparalleled in uh, today's highly levered uh, Western and sometimes Asian um, economies. And finally, uh, the expectation about the future always seems to be quite low, at least from foreigners, which means that the valuation of Iranian companies and opportunities are um, very low. And all of this sets up for a very interesting investment opportunity that very few people have been focusing on due to uh, sanctions over the last 10 to 40 years, depending on how one wants to look at it. Now, obviously, this is true for the country as a whole. Uh, when it comes to investments, you need to be more specific. Uh, we uh, chose to uh, focus on consumer companies because A, uh, they are not, or at least should not be controversial locally. B, they are not sanctioned internationally for humanitarian reasons. Uh, C, uh, they are very uh, connected to the local demographic and the regional demographic and is not linked to what happens sort of in China or in the US. So it's very difficult uh, to invest in something where the price of the commodity is set by incremental demand in China. And it's much more easier to understand the local dynamics, the local supply, the local demand. It's not very capital intensive because I sort of felt from the beginning that it would be difficult raising hundreds and hundreds of millions of euros for Iran to start with. And the consumer space is good in that perspective. And finally, and most importantly, that I will get back to later, consumer companies are not very volatile or cyclical. So it's much easier to withstand economic shocks if you're a consumer company than, for instance, if you're an auto company or a bank. Um, and that is true everywhere, not just in, in Iran. So we um, decided to focus on market leaders with extensive track record in the consumer space. This would obviously be super difficult to source because these companies are usually very profitable and don't need capital. But on the other hand, it would raise the barrier to entry. So if we manage to do it, probably very few other people um, would uh, come after us and try to emulate what we do. We started in 2016 and all the capital that we've raised was done under uh, the Trump administration in the US which sort of tells you how, how difficult it was. We've made four investments so far in the consumer space, and we've generated strong risk-adjusted returns for our investors so far, and I think that it will uh, continue. To sort of come to the second question and talk about the lessons learned, um, obviously when uh, the Trump administration exited the JCPOA in 2018, a bunch of sanctions were piled on, and at least uh, what I was told, Iran became the most sanctioned country in the world. At the same time, we had um, the foreign exchange market effectively collapse, um, and the Iranian real devalued a lot. And this word collapse is interesting because I've been hearing it for the last three years, and I still read it in the newspaper only on, almost on a daily basis when it comes to the Iranian economy. Now, what happened is economics is very difficult and very simple. Um, it's all about supply and demand. So what happened was that a, very, uh, a lot of the foreign companies left because of their uh, 
perception around sanctions. And a lot of the smaller uh, local companies um, had to exit the market because they couldn't uh, get access to financing of raw material. So while demand took a hit locally, supply shrank even more, which benefited uh, the leading manufacturers locally, which we uh, focus on. And that was a part of our strategy, um, as I explained uh, previously. Now, many of the multinational companies operating in Iran who uh, are good friends of mine, when we had our conversations back in 2018, 2019, they were telling me that the models they run globally um, would show that the Iranian purchasing power uh, had gone down by over 50% in real terms. But still, demand didn't collapse. And when we look at it three years later, the economy hasn't been flourishing, and certainly there are a lot of people struggling, but the collapse didn't happen. And the big question in everybody's mind, I think, is why? Why didn't the collapse happen? My hypothesis is the following, which I think is really important to pay attention to. And although I'm not a macroeconomist, I certainly believe this to be uh, correct. First of all, the Iranian consumer is debt-free. We don't have any mortgage market in Iran. We don't have any credit market or credit card market in Iran. And we don't have any leasing market in Iran. So compared to almost any other country that people are used to, the Iranian, comp- the Iranian consumer can't access debt very easily. Second of all, uh, it has one of the highest savings rates in the world. Iranians save a lot of money. And I think um, after China, it's the, it's the second highest in the world. Third of all, a lot of this money, not all of it, but a lot of it is usually put in gold or housing or cars. And these assets, if you will, keep their real purchasing power, even as the currency devalues. So, uh, and and finally, and perhaps more important, most importantly, is that the Iranian consumer is used to turbulence and volatility. So for good or for bad, uh, they have the mental resilience that is often lacking in in many other countries. So when one looks at the income um, that doesn't keep up with inflation, that only tells a part of the story. And unfortunately, the Western mental model and um, mathematical models usually miss some of these dimensions because it's not set up by people who have grown up under sanctions and um, the dynamics are are different than people are, are, are used to. So to come to a conclusion, I think, obviously, the economy hasn't collapsed. I don't see any collapse coming. When I was listening to the macro um, uh, presentation yesterday, I sort of, my conclusion was that the Iranian economy seems to be in a state of heads I win, tails I don't lose much type of scenario, so that if the sanctions are removed, the economy can grow again in a substantial way. And if it's not removed, then it will sort of limp along but it won't sort of um, collapse. So the lessons learned, I would say, is that um, not unexpectedly, it's mentally very difficult to go against the crowd, but economically it pays off. And that certainly has been the experience so far. Uh, I think one needs to do things that nobody else is doing and be right. Certainly we've been doing something that very few people have been doing. And so far it seems that we have been right. And I hope that that will continue. And that Iran is neither perfect nor risk-free, but it's not about being risk-free. It's about offering a solid risk-adjusted returns to foreign investors, and I think it does. So with that, I will uh, conclude this part of the remarks, and I am at your disposal for any questions or comments. Thank you. Thanks very much, Omid. Uh, perhaps let's now turn to Ramin. Uh, Ramin, when the JCPOA started to falter when Trump was elected, Firms like Turquoise Partners that had been trying to build bridges with foreign investors made a strategic decision to focus on domestic investors to serve the local market because they knew that foreign direct investment would become limited. What are some of the trigger points that Turquoise Partners is monitoring, which would lead it to focus on bringing foreign investment into the country? And has your company been preparing for this at all? Um. Hi, Nikki. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here with you all, um, and thank you for inviting me. Uh, Omid uh, touched on uh, some very good facts and figures about the country uh, and why it is a, a very exciting investment destination. I'll focus on uh, our experience uh, in Turquoise, uh, managing foreign money 
in Iran for the last 16 years. And, uh, uh, you know, we went through two full cycles of uh, improving uh, uh, macro political and economic environment and then deteriorating one and then improving one and then deteriorating one. Uh, we started back in 2005 during the final years of uh, President Khatami's presidency when uh, a lot of foreign investment was coming to Iran. It's very difficult to believe today, but uh, most European banks had offices in Tehran and they were growing their offices uh, for more business. And that's the environment in which we started Turquoise Partners uh, with the aim of uh, setting up European-based funds uh, that will invest in Iran, uh, in the equity market, in the private equity, and also in the venture capital. So that's the environment that we started uh, Turquoise with. From 2005 to 2011, uh, uh, we had a FIPA license and uh, we had absolutely no problem with the banking transfers or issues. Uh, it is uh, like a dream today, but... Uh, Back in 2008 uh, to 2010, for three years, uh, we actually paid out a dividend in euros to our European-based investors. I remember two 8% per annum and one 10% per annum. And uh, by, for doing that, all I did was that we sent a letter to our local bank in Iran, at the time, Karofain Bank, uh, with the list of investors around the globe, each of them having a bank account in a, in a European uh, uh, bank and, uh, you know, list of uh, 100 plus investors. Uh, and within days, they received their dividends in their bank account. So from that environment, we all of a sudden uh, went to a period of uh, a strengthening of sanctions between 2010 to 2015, where uh, gradually uh, there were more and more sanctions imposed on Iran, uh, by the United Nations, by the EU, and also the US. And it got to a point that uh, post-2012, uh, basically uh, any kind of uh, legal relationship between Iranian banks and foreign banks is stopped. Uh, uh, Turquoise Partners, as the largest foreign investor on the Iranian stock market, we actually lost our bank accounts outside Iran. And there was no way, no infrastructure to, uh, to attract uh, 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 foreign investment from Europe into the into into Iran, especially uh, when you are talking about institutional investment, uh, which you know has to meet some requirements uh, in terms of money transfers and so on and so forth. Um, then again, with the uh, election in 2013 in Iran uh, and the uh, start of the nuclear negotiations. Uh, there was a sense of uh, a gold rush, uh, and within a span of uh, two years, we hosted more than 250 investment uh, investor delegations in Iran. And I joked at the time that uh, Turquoise was uh, turning into a glorified travel agency. My, my job was to uh, basically host uh, foreign investors, mostly European, in our offices, take them to the, uh, to the Tehran Stock Exchange, take them to visit companies. Uh, and uh, all of that uh, sense of rush and excitement, uh, unfortunately, due to uh, a very short period of time after JCPOA, when uh, uh, Trump got elected and then uh, uh, basically reimposed sanctions on Iran, the actual uh, 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 absolute number of the foreign investment into the Iranian economy was quite limited. Uh, relative to what we uh, what we hoped for and what we envisaged, and uh, again uh, we had to uh, uh, shift turns, uh, as you mentioned, focus on the domestic market, um, and uh, expand our our business domestically. What we've learned uh, uh, over the last sixteen years. And living through these two very large cycles of of macro political and economic events is that. Uh, basically, you have to be resilient, you have to be flexible, and also you have to be uh, quite diversified in terms of uh, your investor base, in terms of your uh, products, and also uh, your services. Uh, at the moment, uh, overall, within um, a Turquoise group of companies, 
uh, we are still the largest foreign investor on the Iranian stock market. We have a European-based regulated equity fund that invests on the Iranian stock market. We have a European-based regulated fixed income fund that invests in uh, Iranian treasury bills and fixed income products. Uh, and we still have an investment banking division that uh, basically uh, advises foreign investors who want to uh, come to the Iranian market. Having said that, next to these uh, uh, basically foreign uh, products that are tailored for foreign investors, we also have several funds, uh, equity funds, fin uh, equity funds, fixed income funds, venture capital funds, uh, private equity funds, and advisory uh, business as well as brokerage uh, that we uh, basically offer to Iranian clients. And to be honest, over the last uh, uh, few years, that has uh, bore fruit and it was a very good strategic shift because I've, as we have witnessed uh, in 2020 in the Iranian stock market, the potential of the local uh, market in Iran is huge, even without foreign investors. When, when foreign investors look at a country, they always look at uh, the local uh, retail and institutional investor base. Uh, because that's what creates liquidity and the, at the end of the day, especially in a country uh, like Iran, where foreign investment as a total percentage of uh, overall investment is quite small. And uh, we witnessed uh, uh, something magical this year uh, on the Iranian stock market, whereby a large percentage of the population uh, got involved uh, into the stock market. The trading volumes of the Tehran Stock Exchange, which historically was between 50 to 100 million dollars a day, reached as high as 1.3 billion dollars a day. And that uh, shows that Iran has a very strong uh, and very uh, sophisticated uh, local investor base, which is actually quite attractive uh, for uh, foreign investors. Uh, to go back to your specific questions of what we see as triggers of uh, moving back or, 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 or re-changing re our focus back to foreign investments, uh, 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 the fact of the matter is that the, the basic operational infrastructure has to be in place in order to be able to raise serious money uh, from Europe uh, into Iran. Uh, we experienced that uh, firsthand post JCPOA, and I can tell you specifically what were the reasons why the amount of money that actually came to Iran was a lot lower than anticipated. Uh, and we, we still have some of the same problems. The, uh, the, the first one and most obvious one is banking relationship. So a workable, functional, uh, formal banking routes whereby you can have a bank account in Iran and a bank account in Europe and you can easily transfer money back and forth using formal banking routes. That's, I think, one of the infrastructure uh, that must be in place to be able to raise serious money, especially institutional money. Um, uh, but other than that, even if that is sorted, in order to raise large financial investment into the Iran, I'm not talking about corporates because they have a different story, uh, but financial investment, we need to have basically a formal custody relationship between uh, the Iranian stock market or the central depository of Iran, uh, local banks in Iran, uh, as well as a uh, global custody banks, which, uh, you know, uh, I, I believe it will take a long time for global custody banks to be able to establish a relationship with uh, Iranian banks. But I see that uh, uh, we saw that as an exp uh, as part of our experiment and last time that unless that a uh, custody relationship is resolved, uh, raising serious money financial from financial and institutional investors uh, is quite uh, difficult. Uh, for corporates, is a diff different story. I think corporations that want to come to Iran to sell their goods and services. Uh, they will be the first to come. Uh, right, right after JCPOA, it was the same thing. Uh, corporates came a lot faster than financial investors. And uh, in our investment banking division, uh, almost all of our clients were foreign European uh, multinationals that were looking to come to the Iranian market. Uh, I see the same thing happening potentially post 
uh, uh, basically return to JCPOA. I think corporates will come uh, first. Uh, but uh, uh, if I want to answer your question in one word, I think uh, the, uh, the operational infrastructure, especially the banking, formal banking relationship is the main trigger we look at uh, to shift our focus back to foreign investors. Thank you very much, Ramin. Um, Machia, I'd like to now turn to you and ask, what makes Iran's market similar to other emerging markets where the stock, stock exchange is large? And which sectors do you think are attractive for foreign investment? Um, hi, Nikki. Um, also, thank you very much for the invitation to the forum. Um, so, well, first of all, large markets are just very interesting for foreign investors. Um, this is also what caught my attention in, back in 2016. I used to manage um, equity long short investment portfolios initially with uh, US investment banks, then with some hedge funds in London across uh, most developed and emerging markets. So many emerging and frontier markets, including places like Eastern Europe, um, uh, but also Southeast Asia, China, Asia, um, um, yeah, so Vietnam, even in places like Kenya. Um, Iran was always there as something potentially interesting, but it was close. So uh, so no one could do anything. Um, so in 2016, when it initially opened up, at least with UN sanctions, um, I did more research and realized that, um, well, the market is, is comparing to other emerging markets is very large and very diversified. So it's uh, not only you know, 600 companies, but across more than 50 different industries. And this is much more interesting than um, countries that are um, commodity driven. So, for example, petrostates in the Gulf, where um, all of the exposure that foreign investors can get um, is towards, um, you know, one single driver, for example, uh, prices of certain uh, commodity like oil. Um, so, um, so, so this is the main similarity. It's very interesting for foreign investors. And also it offers liquidity. So um, as opposed to markets, for example, like, um, I don't know, Uzbekistan, which is also developing in the right direction, but there is nothing to do for, not much to do for portfolio investors because it doesn't offer liquidity um, on the stock market. And liquidity is important because it will um, help attract foreign investment once all the other restrictions are, are lifted as well, as, of course. Um, it will also help eventually um, include Iran to international indices, uh, which will bring um, even more capital to the country. Um, it may also actually um, help um, create a situation that was similar to markets such as China, Russia, Poland, many other countries that were open markets that were opening up to foreign in investors. Foreign investors were suddenly bringing a lot of cash to the market, creating a, an amazing bull market uh, that lasted for, uh, well, with a lot of volatility, but amazing bull markets that lasted for years. Um, the, the other very important similarity to, um, to other emerging markets with, stock, uh, with large stock markets, in, uh, domestic stock markets, um, is a high participation of retail investors. And um, this has, uh, well, good and bad sides to it. Um, but primarily positive. Um, so as Ramin was saying, you actually don't need much uh, foreign liquidity or external liquidity um, uh, to have a functioning market and actually to have a proper, very strong bull market, as we have seen over the last uh, actually two years in Iran. Um, because it's driven by retail investors who are responsible by probably 80 to 90 percent of, of, of daily flows. It is, um, it is much less efficient than uh, developed markets. And this inefficiency, on one hand, creates volatility. Um, so this is the negative side to it. Um, but on the other hand, um, those inefficiencies create many investment opportunities. So we as uh, professional money managers um, find many more um, inefficiencies, uh, investment opportunities, arbitrage opportunities on the market in Iran than anywhere else in the world. Um, and this is also another thing that will attract uh, professional investors, uh, big foreign funds. Um, so um, regarding your second question, the sectors, 
the biggest beneficiary um, of the last couple of years in Iran, of the, actually of the macro instability in Iran over the last couple of years, um, were manufacturers. Um, so Omit was saying about the, uh, the discussion about the economy, whether it collapsed or not collapsed, because it's not uh, really e even, it's not, it's not visible in all the parts of the economy. Well, oil uh, linked, uh, oil, uh, the part of the economy that is related to oil actually collapsed, yes. So it was 15% of GDP, it went down by 80%. So obviously, this had a big impact on the, on the aggregate number. Um, but the non-oil part of the economy actually uh, expanded in many areas. Um, even unemployment went down. Um, why? Well, because um, the exporters um, actually benefited from uh, the um, instability of the macroeconomic environment. They benefited from um, the currency that went down by, by I think, 85% under Trump. Um, imagine you're an exporter, dollar rallies by 50%, your revenues will go up by 50%, uh, but your costs are in real, your revenues are, are in dollars, um, your, your earnings, your margins will expand uh, much more than your revenues are, go are, are growing. So um, you have many companies in the country um, that are not only hedged against the currency depreciation, but actually benefit uh, from what was going on. So um, um, manufacturing, okay, so, so, okay, so this was the, the first order effect, I would say, that, that exporters were benefiting. But what, what happened afterwards is that, um, and also Omid touched on that, that imports collapsed. Imports collapsed because, uh, well, the currency was weak. So um, whoever, whoever uh, was exporting to Iran earlier was uh, no longer competitive with their prices. But also because of sanctions, there were many more trade restrictions, trade barriers. So payments became even more difficult, um, insurance even more difficult, all the logistics. Um, so who benefited from this? Domestic, domestic producers who were gaining market share because their competitors were priced out of the market. So even though the overall market, the overall um, segment in which they were operating was not growing, their share of their segment was was increasing so we could see uh, companies um, increasing the volumes of their products that they were selling and also being able to to raise prices because they had pricing power um, so um, manufacturing has been uh, the most um, uh, interesting over the last couple of years i think it will continue to be interesting because well, I strongly believe that Iran is on the right path, and it's. I think it's the most exciting market to be to be in for the next decade. Um, so uh, we'll see about the pace, but things should be moving in the right direction. And when the country will be opening up, properly opening up, um, many local companies, including exporters, will benefit from. Um, the business um, uh, conditions that would be much easier for them. So, for example, transaction costs will go down. Uh, they will not have to um, offer discounts to entice foreign consumers to buy their products because it, these are Iranian products, so it's more difficult to buy them. Um, uh, the, um, the payments will be easier. So overall transactional costs will be lower, uh, which, which would, again, help improve their margins. Also, more um, buyers will be willing to buy Iranian products, so the volumes should go up um, as well. But another very interesting um, change that, uh, that, that, I, that I expect will happen in the future is that um, stability in the macro environment, which means mainly the currency, which will bring the stability to um, local prices, so um, inflation should, should stabilize. And um, this, this will mean that um, households will regain uh, purchasing power. So the, the previous four years, when the currency dropped by 85% versus dollar, um, effectively transferred income from households to manufacturers, uh, which were the, the sole beneficiaries of, 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 of the macro. Um, I expect that this may change in the future with the bigger stability and households um, will again have much more disposable income, hence 
um, also sectors, industries related to consumer spending um, should benefit as well. Thank you very much, Mathieu. So we've so far heard some of the opportunities that the Iranian market presents for foreign investors. Pirzan, I want to ask you, to what extent do you think that some of these opportunities in Iran are meaningful to your clients? And perhaps maybe you can detail some of the legal challenges that European investors interested in Iran have faced. Thanks, Nikki. Um, so first of all, hi to everyone. Um, I just wanted to start with observing, noting the quality of uh, the, the panelists, because the, the flow of information that's been provided, um, I think, by um, all of them um, so far um, is just amazing. And I think for an interested foreign potential for a trader that, um, you know, the, the successful examples and the quality, the professional quality of the panelists um, says that things are possible because um, uh, in a market like Iran, you need to be led and you need to uh, see how it is possible to succeed. Um, uh, so as regards uh, Denton's Europe, um, it's many years now that we're uh, working on Iran with our associated office APP in Tehran. And um, in the period between 2015 and, um, uh, and now, uh, and specifically before the U.S. withdrawal, we have helped a number of clients and, uh, and been witness, uh, to reply to your question, Nikki, uh, we have been uh, witness of, uh, you know, um, hurdles out of Iran and, and challenges in Iran, which I will now explain. First of all, of course, um, the sanction uh, regime and the... And, uh, and the KYC and the due diligence job um, is something to be done. And, and in, in today's world where compliance is extremely important all over the world and not in Iran, um, this should not come as a surprise. Uh, certain areas are uh, under uh, EU sanctions and these are quite clear areas. For the rest is to know who you are doing business with, which is important. And there you have many uh, advisors who can provide you due diligence on your counterpart. You can have the dialogue with your counterpart and, and move forward. On further side, though, this is not um, the EU sanctions or even US secondary sanctions is not the biggest hurdle I see. The biggest hurdle I see is really the European uh, countries not having done their job properly and not having employed uh, and applied their own laws and their own principles. I have in front of my eyes a document from the European Union Agency for Fundamental Rights, so an EU document that is called Freedom to Conduct a Business, Exploring the Dimensions of a Fundamental Right. Please go on Google and find that. Uh, you will see that freedom of entrepreneurship is a very important freedom. Yet, the hurdles our clients have faced very often is third party, third party uh, over compliance. We, we discussed over compliance in the first panel this morning. Um, third party insurers, third party banks, and so on and so forth. Um, uh, trying to prevent and making difficult the freedom our clients have to do a compliant and lawful and sanctioned compliant business with Iran. So even when the business is compliant and uh, sanctioned compliant and the KYC is done, too often um, uh, specifically smaller companies, not blue chip companies, uh, which are very well equipped to uh, overcome those hurdles and resist to pressure. So other companies come under pressure. And here, this is simply a job of uh, implementation of law, implementation of principles, of legislation that is not done inside uh, EU um, member states. So I think that there is a lot that EU member states can do when, and they have been reported that times and times again, when they see and they know 
that um, a very, very, even humanitarian trade cannot proceed because uh, the, the, you know, a third bank, a tier one bank comes and bullies uh, the company that wants to export some humanitarian trade to Iran. This is absolutely unacceptable and has to change going forward. Secondly, on the Iranian front now, we think that it is, uh, you know, we have seen hurdles and we think that on the Iranian side, there's a lot of room for uh, improvement um, and, and that this period of time um, on the Iranian side, uh, there could be some genuine thinking how to improve uh, legal environment. I will give you uh, some concrete example. We have had cases where um, the acquisition of a company by a foreign foreigner or participation in the equity of a company in Iran um, was made complicated, was complicated because the target companies in Iran sometimes have a lot of past liabilities and, um, and debts in general that sometimes is higher than the value of the asset of that target company or target partner. And therefore, what one of the things that the Iranian legal environment uh, lacks and makes things a bit complicated um, is the, the fact that we, should, we could have in the Iranian legal environment ways to clean up past liability and past debt. And for instance, and very practically, this could be bringing the assets, say a plant, a manufacturing plant, to a newly established company, right? Therefore, you would have the joint venture or the acquisition of the production facilities in a company with no past liability, with a brand new company with, with no debt and past liability. Except that from a tax perspective in Iran, such a move is extremely expensive because you have to pay taxes for in-kind contribution or asset transfers and so on and so forth. So again, here there could be a lot of um, improvement. Also, uh, when you and, and the country is willing to um, have plants work and, uh, and manufacturing industrial uh, projects work, um, but at the same time, you have uh, uh, industrial economic zones in Iran for this type of industrial projects where the lease there, this is based on a kind of a lease uh, agreement um, uh, only, and you cannot have full ownership because of the specifics of the industrial zone that is based on a, a only three year renewable lease. So when you do a massive industrial investment in a plant, you want to be sure you're there for at least 15 years or more, but you cannot afford to think that you may have the end of the lease every three years where you are going to invest massive sums of money. And again, here, there is room for improvement of the legal environment on the, um, on the, on the Iranian side. So as you can see on the European side, for the sake and an own interest of European companies and corporations, there's a room for progress on the EU side and EU member states. And in Iran, it's not to make a gift to, to foreigners to change these laws or improve or make their legal reforms necessary. It is for the own sake of uh, making this uh, transaction investment even more fluid inside Iran. And that will benefit any Iranian company uh, dealing with each other and not only foreigners dealing with Iranian companies. I think earlier, Maciej mentioned a few examples of other countries which have gone through uh, legal transformation and tr uh, transition, economy, tr uh, you know, economies in transition, and mentioned Poland. I think Poland made massive reforms and is the, one of the most successful uh, destinations for foreign direct investment in the world, thanks to this combination of legal reforms and opportunity that um, the uh, uh, Poland's accession to the European Union created for foreign investors. I will only fin I will finish on that topic with one last point. Um, everybody has spoken about the opportunities. I think that what we have seen and what we would advise is that indeed this time around, when foreign companies um, approach the Iranian market and also their Iranian counterpart, um, 
organize and structure their negotiations um, in, in a better way, um, in a more structured way. The foreign side prepares, and I think that uh, some of our panelists underlined very well, that contrary to many other countries, Iran has bilateral investment treaties with many European uh, countries, uh, 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 tax avoidance treaties with many European countries, um, has its own law protecting foreign investment. So all this preparation will make the job of the foreign side going to Iran clearer, more secure. They will be asking less questions. Um, so I will finish on that point. There's a lot to say, uh, Nikki, but uh, I think this gives you the picture of uh, the fact that many things are possible and yet many things um, could be done to improve further. Thank you, Pierre-Zon. Um, so we've received a question from the audience. I'd like to address this question to both uh, Dr. Musavi and Ramin. Um, sustainability and renewables are increasingly part of investor concerns in Europe. What are some of the opportunities, issues, and foreseen situation in Iran? If you could just briefly answer this question in one or two minutes, perhaps uh, let's begin with Ramin, and then we'll turn on to uh, turn towards Dr. Mustavi. Uh, sure. Um, I think uh, Nikki, uh, if I wanted to just uh, finish my uh, basically presentation with one sentence, I would say that uh, Iran as an investment destination, uh, rewards uh, resilience and stamina. Uh, this is what uh, I've learned over the years working in Iran uh, uh, as a foreign investor. And I think uh, uh, if you, you have to, uh, uh, when investing in Iran, you have to look, look at it as a long-term investment. Uh, you have to understand that uh, it is an uh, uh, emerging market. So a lot of the laws and regulations are improving on a, a daily, weekly, monthly basis. Uh, and uh, just to give you an example, two years ago, I had one of my foreign investors that uh, has been with us in our fund for the last uh, 10 years. And he was telling me that, you know, after 10 years of investing in Iran in Euro denominated uh, terms, um, uh, because of the devaluations, you have to remember that Iranian currency in the last uh, decade, uh, from 2011 to this year, has devalued by 95%. So, you know, you have to uh, produce uh, and generate a, a superb, fantastic return to be able to cover devaluation and all, on, on top of that generate some euro denominated return. So he was telling me that, you know, how come uh, after 10 years, I haven't made that much money investing in a high risk emerging market. Two years after that, with everything that happened on the stock market, his annualized return topped 20%. So you just have to give Iran time and uh, be a long-term investor and be resilient and uh, flexible and have the stamina. Uh, uh, it's not a quick uh, uh, touch and go market for a quick uh, you know, buck. Um, uh, I hope uh, that answers your questions. And I know you're tight for time, so I won't uh, uh, go any further. Sure, thank you, Ramin. Uh, Dr. Musavi, if I can just ask you the two final questions. So the first question from the audience on what are the opportunities um, relating to sustainability and renewables in Iran, and just a final comment on what would you like to tell um, potential EU uh, European investors who are interested in Iran? Um, you know, um, just a few words uh, after uh, the comment made by. Um, uh, uh, panelists, especially Ramin and Omid, I would like to mention that um, the uh, European that uh, please hurry up because even if this situation, the heavy sanction this year, we have uh, already issued you know for for uh, license FIFA license for more than five billion US dollars. Next week uh, would be a, a final uh, uh, um, uh, session uh, of the special board, which um, you know issuing the license uh, for for investment, and, and again we are going to have uh, more than five hundred million US dollar for investment. Even in this situation, and a lot, a, a large portion of, of, of that investment, it, it is on, on 
renewable. Still, you know, because of the geographical situ uh, location of Iran, uh, we have a good potential of that and a uh, good market um, to receive that uh, electricity from renewable energy. Uh, having said that, um, um, uh, we are uh, uh, trying to also give more incentive for investment uh, in um, very uh, near future. I stop here. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Musavi. And I think with that, we'll end this discussion. Um, I'd like to thank you all very much for your insightful comments. I'm sure that the audience found them very informative. And thank you for the audience to tuning in. Thank you. Nikki, thank you for leading that very important discussion on the current uh, status, the prospects of European investment in Iran. Some important views from the Iranian government's perspective. We heard from investors, uh, asset managers. We heard about the real obstacles, challenges, difficulties that exist. But we also heard, according to our panelists, uh, about the possibilities, the potentials that exist in the Iranian market. Machia Voitel of Amtalan Capital predicting that the Iranian market is going to be the most exciting uh, market in the next 10 day, uh, 10 uh, in the next decade. We also heard from Mr. Musavi representing the Iranian government calling on uh, investors to hurry up. It is 1.34 p.m. local time here in Tehran, 11.04 a.m. Central European time. We're going to take a short break. When we come back, we're going to move to our next panel discussion, this one focusing on the increasingly growing and dynamic private sector here in Iran, efforts by the Iranian government to expand the private sector, the important role the private sector plays in the Iranian economy. If you are a policymaker in Europe, a business leader in Europe, I think you're going to get information and insight uh, from leaders of Iran's private sector in the next panel discussion that you're not going to get anywhere else. So stay with us. This is the Europe-Iran Business Forum, the largest ever online conference examining uh, Europe and Iran uh, trade. So glad you're with us. Come back and join us in about a half hour.